Museum and Library on the occasion of a public lecture on Japan's Indo-Pacific vision, concepts, opportunities, and challenges by Professor Ken Jimbo, Faculty of Policy Management, Keio University. It is uh, our pleasure today that uh, Professor Ken Jimbo has uh, agreed to deliver this lecture on this very interesting subject on a very short notice at the Nehru Memorial. I thank him for his uh, kind consent and I welcome uh, all members of the audience on the occasion of this public lecture. Uh, Japan, of course, is a very, very important country uh, for India and the world in terms of international relations and international politics. And especially Japan's Indo-Pacific vision is uh, very, very important for uh, Asia as a whole and for India particularly. Indo-Pacific uh, is a concept that has uh, gained increasing ground in the recent years. Um, the earlier concept that was popular, that of Asia-Pacific, was comparatively irrational and illogical. And Indo-Pacific highlights the importance of the fact that throughout human history, it was the Indian Ocean actually that was at the heart of the world economy. This fact is re-highlighted, re-emphasized by calling it uh, Indo-Pacific rather than uh, Asia-Pacific. So I hope this, this uh, nomenclature and this, uh, this new concept, or rather the concept has been there, this uh, renewed emphasis on this uh, uh, existing uh, uh, concept would be helpful for uh, all parties concerned, for the international community, for all the countries, and it would be able to uh, provide a new vision to the foreign policy of uh, the concerned countries. With these few words, I uh, uh, once again welcome Dr. Kane Jimbo and uh, invite him to deliver his lecture on the subject. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Director Mishra, for kindly introducing uh, me. And uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, everyone who uh, attends to this uh, seminar. Um, this is my third visit to uh, India in my, in my life. Actually, I'm uh, very pleased uh, to be uh, back to uh, Delhi. And this time, uh, it is the like a longest visit, uh, the whole week uh, being dedicated to uh, joining the program uh, sponsored by Japan Foundation. They do have a program to offer like a Japan Studies support uh, at the Jawa Nehru University. Uh, they do have a East Asia Japan Studies uh, programs and uh, dozens of uh, PhD MPhil uh, program students are now uh, researching and writing about the social science uh, on something related to uh, Japan. So I was invited there to uh, offer my lectures and also join in the intensive discussion uh, seminar. And meanwhile, I'll try to, uh, you know, see my friends, uh, my good friends uh, in Delhi. And uh, when I uh, contacted Dr. Sanjay uh, that I wish to see you uh, during my uh, visit, and he was very kind enough uh, to quickly organize this uh, roundtable seminar. So taking this uh, excellent uh, occasion, I uh, wish that I could really share uh, what I'm going to say uh, today about the contemporary Japanese foreign policy uh, on uh, Indo-Pacific, and I wish that uh, there will be a library discussion uh, and the questions and comments uh, regarding uh, this topic uh, as well. So thank you very much once again uh, for uh, organizing uh, this. Um, Deputy Director Mishra just, uh, you know, uh, mentioned uh, that uh, the regional frame, uh, framing of the Indo-Pacific has now uh, become a very important uh, benchmark and the uh, world has found uh, the Indian Oceans uh, is one of the epicenters uh, of the regional dynamics and I fully agree uh, with that. And in terms of the how Japan, you know, uh, frame its own regional uh, policy in past decades. I think it is the first time, I mean, that uh, Japan has now officialized uh, the Indo-Pacific policy uh, as such uh, because we've engaged in the uh, different sets of the regional, uh, you know, uh, emphasis such as Asia-Pacific, uh, 1980s, uh, you know, and also East Asia in 1990 and uh, uh, 2000 expanded East Asian, uh, you know, regions with uh, ASEAN Plus uh, engagement with uh, ARF, ADMM Plus, East Asian Summit, uh, and so on. And then we came 
now with the Indo-Pacific. So seemingly like uh, we are actually expanding our regional concept gradually uh, in the past uh, decades uh, also. This is the first understanding. But in my sense that, uh, again, Japan has been the Indo-Pacific power for long, longer years. And uh, in the, since 1960s and 70s, and the Japan's uh, especially growing demand on, on the, the strategic uh, energy issues, in uh, especially oil, uh, from uh, Middle Eastern countries uh, such as Saudi Arabia, Oman, UAE, and that actually uh, create the Japanese strategic emphasis on the sea lane access to that region, and the Indian Ocean obviously uh, comes in. And we also expanded our unique diplomatic relation uh, with Middle East. There, there are somewhere that the Japan is. Um, behaving more independently than the United States because we have cultivated the good relation with Iran and we also have uh, a very unique stance towards dealing with the Middle Eastern uh, you know, peace process uh, as well. In that sense that we are also the Indo-Pacific power uh, in terms of uh, engaging uh, so much a strategic important issue uh, I think uh, since uh, 1960s and uh, 70s as well. So sea lanes of communication, maritime safety, freedom of navigation has been the, the fundamental, uh, I think, importance for the Japanese uh, security. But this time I specifically would like to focus on the officialized version of the uh, Japan's Indo-Pacific vision, and uh, I would like to also offer my uh, personal take uh, and analysis and what's been going on, and especially what Japan tried to achieve and why has been the case uh, that the Japan wished to uh, you know, promote this uh, uh, Indo-Pacific vision policy and what are the benefits and also the challenges uh, to uh, this concept. These, these are the, basically the outline of my uh, speech today. So first of all, um, something that i like to share with you today is that the Japanese government, you know, vision of the Indo-Pacific is a still unfixed and it's an evolutionary concept. And I, I can tell you some uh, example. By looking at this map, um, I, I still, it, there is, uh, it is the, you know, official released uh, map of the Japanese concept of the Indo-Pacific policy, but you can easily find that there are differences <laughs> in the, how they try to configure uh, the Indo-Pacific as a geographical uh, coverage concept. Well, first, you know, 2017, you can see that the two circles with the yellow and, uh, and, and the blue. But the second map you can see in the top right, uh, that also, uh, you know, brings in the western part of the United States, uh, and they also wider part of the South Pacific is also under the concept. And then on the third map on the, you know, left bottom, uh, you, so you suddenly see the role of the ASEAN, uh, you know, uh, comes in. So I think seemingly um, my, my practical analysis is that the foreign Minister of Foreign Affairs is not so prepared uh, so much, you know. And then once you find the map, uh, first of all, in 2017, somebody says that where is ASEAN? You, you should not forget the Japanese, you know, regional policy and the importance of ASEAN. And then suddenly put something in, and then on, on the top, on the right, they said that where is the importance of the United States? We are not actually creating the policy that excludes the United States. And then that, that put it in. So it is pretty much the kind of uh, flexible concept in the positive sense, but in the something that extraordinary way of exp uh, you know, ex explaining this uh, is that uh, it is uh, very much uh, based on the transactional uh, way to look at uh, Japanese uh, evolutionary uh, concept as well. And second example that I mentioned about uh, the you know, evolutionary change and non-fix is that we even changed the name uh, of this concept. Uh, a few years back, we said that this is a strategy, right? Uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy is the Japanese official policy. So this is the map you can find a couple of years ago, but now we have a new version here, free and open Indo-Pacific, period. Okay, so we dropped off the strategy, and then we call it vision uh, as of today. There are no official explanation whatsoever on why we have uh, changed the name, but uh, everybody um, arguing uh, that 
this is more like an inclusive concept. And strategy sounds like uh, what uh, you will find the enemy, and you you're going to take uh, measures, uh, and then you you going through the lots of serious competitions. And that's not what we I, I think that not the current day Japanese government send the message, especially to China. And then we are uh, in the uh, you know past one one and a half years. Of the reconciliation uh, with China, we are even in inviting uh, President Xi Jinping to Tokyo in April. We are not sure whether he could come uh, under the coronavirus. Uh, you know, uh, all, all the situations are there, but I, it, it has a lots of implication. What is the true nature of our Indo-Pacific uh, vision uh, is all about? That involves the competition part, of, you know, obviously, but also it brings in a lots of like uh, new interface for cooperation collaboration uh, with China uh, as well. So we are in the very much in the nuanced and uh, you know amb ambivalent uh, way of understanding what what is the real goal uh, of the Indo-Pacific uh, is all about. So let me go through very quickly about the brief background of how it has been generated. And uh, what, could, what, what has been the, the practical uh, measures uh, under this uh, concept as well? Well, uh, I think uh, many of you uh, have been aware uh, that uh, this concept has been officially launched uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, one of the origin uh, that you can find is the TCAT conference uh, in Africa in uh, August 19, 2016. So it was officially launched in Africa. Uh, and because it was launched in Africa, the geographical coverage obviously uh, extended to the east of Africa. Uh, obviously, that involves India, Middle East, and also Southeast Asia, uh, and, and also the bigger uh, regions. And he brings in the concept that the union of two free and open oceans and two continents, two oceans means Indian Oceans and Pacific Oceans, and also uh, the, the continents means the uh, Eurasian continent and African continents. What a, what a vast kind of uh, coverage. And uh, normally we say that if you try to bring in such kind of uh, geographical coverage, uh, you will lose the kind of uh, 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 integrated kind of a way to analyze uh, the regional dynamics. Obviously, you can argue there is a different dynamics in the different region. You know, South Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and uh, Southern Pacific, uh, Trans-Pacific. Trans Every, everything has to be, uh, you know, differently understood. That was the kind of the, the traditional notion of analyzing uh, the region. But uh, Japan wished to say there has been the lots of connection and connectivity uh, to uh, look at throughout this, uh, you know, two uh, big areas. Uh, and then it might be uh, worthwhile uh, to send, set up the, the common platform, applying the common principles and uh, uh, setting up the kind of common kind of strategy uh, by connecting the two regions. That was, the, you know, the general kind of motivation and origin of the how uh, Abe tried to, you know, reach out uh, in the uh, TICAT conference. And on, on the way to establishing such uh, official policy, there has been several signals and the elements that leads to uh, the formation of the um, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy uh, at that time. A uh, couple of things uh, that you can have in, in, in your mind. First of all, that there was the Prime Minister's benchmark speech in India uh, in 2007 when he was a Prime Minister, uh, you know, 1.0. And he came to India and uh, deliver uh, the speech, a uh, confluence of the two seas and, you know, two seas. And that was also brings in uh, some notions that uh, Japan is now uh, outreaching to India uh, in the wider strategic kind of geographical uh, concept. And that was uh, clearly demonstrated. But unfortunately, Prime Minister Abe had to resign because of his health problem uh, only one month after uh, his visit to India. So this um, concept didn't really take off uh, as he wished. But he very fortunately became a Prime Minister once again, uh, December 2012, and he started to bring in some of the notion he wished to uh, achieve in the second term of the Abe administration. And uh, you can trace back uh, some of those ideas in the following um, uh, remarks and uh, articles. Uh, 2012, Asia's Democratic Security Diamond. I personally don't like this one, uh, but still, uh, I think that 
trace back to the, you know, the original form of the Quad uh, should be the basis of the security engagement uh, of, uh, of Japan. I don't think it's been too much officialized in the ministerial sense, but in his mindset as an uh, individual prime minister, uh, he actually had uh, such kind of uh, uh, concept uh, you know, uh, soon after uh, he became uh, prime minister again. In 2013, there's more like uh, institutional processes. Uh, he mentioned uh, at the, I think it was a Bandun conference in 2013, the bounty of the open seas, the focus about the, how important the rule-based maritime order should be uh, established. And that also uh, brings into his uh, Shangri-La Dialogue keynote speech in 2014. Uh, he actually um, mentioned um, 13 times in a very short speech. Uh, about uh, freedom of navigation and rule-based uh, international order uh, in his space. So those are the kind of, uh, uh, I mean, preface of how the uh, free and open the Pacific strategy uh, has been formulated uh, up towards the 2016. And let me just to highlight what, what are the key elements uh, of uh, current Japanese uh, concept, and I think uh, two things are uh, at most important because uh, if you look at the foreign ministry's uh, PowerPoint slides and, uh, you know, the explanatory slides, there are so many tiny projects uh, have to be written up and you cannot really read them uh, all. I think that, uh, you know, grasping the bigger picture of what we are trying to get at is, uh, I think, most more important uh, than looking at each project. So the big picture, uh, they said that the, basically that the coverage of the geographical scope, uh, as I mentioned, it's a two continents and two oceans. Asia, Africa, Pacific Ocean, and Indian Ocean, that's a really big uh, kind of a concept. That's number one. And secondly, what, what are the key concepts of the Indo-Pacific strategy? You can divide it into three parts. Uh, one is more like uh, principle uh, aspects. The rule of law, freedom, navigation, free trade, uh, the free part. Uh, those are uh, the basic principle uh, to be uh, pursued. And second is the economic aspects uh, and connectivity, uh, especially when we talk about connectivity, there are three parts. One is the physical connectivity, so infrastructure, roads, and railroads, um, ports, and those are, those, uh, those are uh, you know, the main elements. And second, people-to-people -people connectivity, exchange, uh, you know, uh, programs, and so on. And institutional connectivity, why, why don't we let those um, uh, ASEAN-led institutional mechanisms, TPP-11, RCEP, we have to discuss it later. Uh, but th those are, I think, uh, important uh, elements uh, to pursue uh, the connectivity. I think recently Japanese government added the digital uh, parts of the connectivity uh, scope uh, as well. And the, finally, on the security part, uh, we uh, specifically highlighted the capacity building and the HADR, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, uh, has been the important uh, elements uh, to pursue in the Indo-Pacific strategy. I, as a security expert, uh, I personally think that this it doesn't really reflect the reality of the Japanese Indo-Pacific strategy because when we talk about security, what, what do you think that most important part that Japan wish to promote, that is keep United States in, uh, in this region. So through the alliance and networks, how to secure the stable U.S. presence uh, in this region as a at most important kind of a dominant factor for Japan to pursue its regional strategy. In, in my sense, that is true, but it doesn't say, you know, it, it's not been said uh, in the Japanese official strategy, and uh, I ask a senior official why, why, we, why that is the case. Uh, it said this is, you know, it is not the kind of a diplomatic blue book uh, to structurize what Japan uh, is doing, and this is how uh, Japan is trying to engage the regional partners. So you cannot, you know, go to the ASEAN to say that the United States is important. If you go to, you cannot really go to like uh, other regional countries uh, to say that the uh, U.S.-Japan alliance should be, uh, you know, embraced more uh, in the region. We should focus more on the collaboration part, uh, like um, uh, HADR capacity building. That will enhance the inf interface of the military-to-military -military, uh, cooperation. And I think it's a very much a diplomatic political purpose why we have picked up uh, such kind of uh, measures uh, in our strategy. And as such, uh, you can find that the Japanese, uh, you know, diplomatic services emphasis uh, on the subject by saying that, well, this concept is not, you know, exclusive to anybody. So not to create any new, new institution or overriding, undermining existing organizations 
um, to not to upset the you know certain actors. And uh, when I have an internal talk with uh, foreign ministry officials and uh, some other national security secret officials, and, and uh, he, he they emphasize me that Professor Jimbo, this is this concept is not about China. Okay, so this is very open to everybody, more constructive measures and so on. But my personal take, if this concept is about China, right, it is obviously is about China. So I think, uh, you know, the, the official scope of what they say in the public and uh, what we interpret, what Japan wishes to do, should be different. And so that's why what the academic role uh, to decipher what is happening in the place uh, is so important. But I think I, I understood uh, what, what uh, you know, um, our foreign policy uh, at the front uh, should be saying because um, uh, it is about you know uh, reconfirming uh, Japan's uh, engagement in the region has been there for many decades because when, when, when we talk about, you know, look at the Japan foreign ministry's uh, you know website there's so many projects that has been going for for many years so we are trying to recollect such, such kind of uh, you know individual engagement under the umbrella of the, those three pillars. And then we call it Indo-Pacific strategy. And this is what, you know, how I think we, I should, we should uh, interpret uh, those kind of things. So we are not, we are, we are doing some new, um, you know, uh, new aspects under this concept, but I think that the uh, major part uh, of what we are trying to do is to reconfirm uh, the existing projects under the umbrella of the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, strategy. And that's my first uh, take uh, by looking at this uh, big picture. And then my second take, which I would like to share with you today, which uh, I don't think the Japanese government would totally tell you about. I, I was very critical about the uh, Japanese government previous um, concept uh, that is called the Arco Freedom and Prosperity in 2006 and 7. And some officials still say that this is the origin of the Indo-Pacific strategy. And I would say this might be the original, but the, we call it version one. And now we are in the version two. And version one and version two are significantly different. And the difference is that basically in the version one in 2006 and seven, we have emphasized the value aspects. What kind of value we're talking about, with, uh, such as freedom, democracy, and human rights. And what's wrong all about it? But when, when we talk about the value can be very important, and then we look at the region, with, and uh, according to the Freedom House, uh, the democracy is going backwards, and uh, Southeast Asia, you know, Thailand, Coop, Philippines, lots of like, uh, you know, issues of uh, governance, um, uh, Indonesia going very conservative. Uh, and then, you know, let's have a democracy as a way to have a formulate the first layer of the diplomatic cooperation with us. That wouldn't really take the reality, uh, especially uh, when we engage with the transitional uh, states. Uh, what about Vietnam? Vietnam has, will, uh, is becoming, uh, you know, um, the, the chair state for ASEAN. And when we try to have a strategic engagement with Vietnam through having a value component in Japanese diplomatic services, I think we'll lose a lot of uh, opportunities. And so that, that's number one, why we failed. Uh, in, this, in this concept. And secondly, uh, I also like to wish to, uh, you know, uh, remind you, I mean, that um, imagine what, what really happened in the two uh, mid-2000. United States, um, under the George W. Bush administration, they have gone through the 9-11s and a very difficult period of time and came, came up with a new China policy called the um, responsible stakeholder, if you will. <laughs> That's a, you know... Um, Long, long, you know, feel like a long time ago. <laughs> but, uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, Robert Zolik, who used to be the president of World Bank, came to the administration and said that we need a new China policy. The previous China policy was called the engagement policy since 1990s, and during that time, the China was, you know, basically outside of the international system after the TM and, and, and those. So the United States decided, you know, it's better to not to isolate China but to engage them. So asking them to become an APEC member, WTO, and open up the economy, and then expecting them to be a constructive member uh, in the existing international order. But by early 2000, mid-2000, uh, China is doing something more, right? They organize, uh, host the three-party, six-party talks in Korean Peninsula. Uh, they initiated the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to engage Russia and Central Asian countries. 
they also expanded their economic outreach to you know Southeast Asia, so South Asia. Uh, they also send a lots of PKO there. So China has become a more strategic actor than uh, only the country to be engaged by the United States. So China has its own kind of way uh, to um, organize the regional order, uh, so as the United States. So Zolik, by, by listening to his uh, you know, speeches and so on, he said that uh, the United States and China has become a matured relationship. And China has already been part of the international uh, you know, uh, order, so that in order to manage this international order, we need to ask China to become a responsible stakeholder. And that was, the, you know, k kind of China in for, for the moment, China in kind of a notion, uh, and then to, uh, you know, request China to behave more responsibly. During that time that we have established this one, Okay, all right. Um, the Freedom of uh, uh, Prosperity in 2006 and seven, which was uh, pretty much the China out concept. You know, you're not the part of the, you know, the, the international uh, scheme, and so let's have a democracy first. So I think there was a huge kind of uh, mismatch uh, between Japan uh, and the United States over how to look at China. That also cut the kind of survivability of this concept as well. So that's why I was very much, uh, you know, uh, critical uh, about the origin of this, uh, uh, you know, Abe administration policy on how to look at the region. But I think what I mentioned, uh, that version two, is that they have completely dropped off. Not completely, but the significant scale, the dropping off of the value concept. And we are looking at the more pragmatic way of engaging uh, the region. So uh, I think the time is, uh, you know, uh, very constrained so that I, I will go quickly to what I uh, wish to say. The rise of Indo-Pacific region as a strategic concept, this, this doesn't really matter only for uh, uh, Japan, but it's a, it's a kind of a global phenomena that the uh, United States uh, regional engagement has been in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific for long, long years. Uh, and then China's increasing, uh, you know, uh, challenges uh, does pose not only the challenge at uh, uh, near sea, but also the expanded uh, uh, waters and airspace uh, in, in, in the Indo-Pacific region. So that really corresponds why that we need to uh, look at the wider space. And then, uh, as you are well aware, that the geoeconomic outreach under the BRI also uh, gave us a lots of kind of incentives uh, to move it forward. To we need to have a, a, like a contested uh, kind of uh, views to uh, how we can really uh, engage uh, in the region as well. So that also applies to Japan uh, as well. So macro scope backgrounds, uh, you can see the return of geopolitics uh, and the expanding of the geoeconomic uh, spaces. And uh, Japan wished to be uh, one of the, you know, the, the leading fi uh, figure uh, to respond to such kind of uh, regional trends. Rise of China is obviously the one of the, uh, I think, uh, important uh, way to manage that uh, strategy. But uh, as I think uh, I wish to emphasize uh, this part is that when, when we talk about the rise of China, I think we are responding in the, very much in the parallel uh, you know, uh, manner. One is obviously we have adopted the competition policy. Our defense strategy has become tightened. U.S.-Japan uh, defense cooperation uh, has become ever. Uh, realistically uh, robust, but in the economic and social domain, I think we are, we are, our engagement uh, in China has become more constructive uh, rather than competitive. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we uh, encourage the business community like Kedanlen to uh, invest in China more uh, proactively, and uh, we are not taking a United States kind of economic decoupling policy uh, towards China. Uh, to some extent on the 5G Huawei issues that we have done some aspects on the public procurement, but uh, basically uh, we value our uh, investments and also uh, production and value chains, uh, you know, uh, mainly in China uh, as well. So that's why that Xi Jinping uh, and uh, his government uh, analyze that, that this might be the chance that, you know, reconciliation with, with Japan is a good idea, especially under the U.S.-China uh, heavy uh, competition. Uh, and that really triggered uh, that uh, uh, Xi Jinping's visit uh, to Tokyo uh, as well. And uh, security and defense, uh, we um, – let, let me have a couple of minutes more, <laughs> if, if I may. Um, I think the region has been going through the very – 
dynamic change of the distribution of the power because uh, it was in 2005 when Japanese and Chinese defense budget was also liberalized, almost the same under the U.S. dollar time. Now China spends more, more like a five times bigger than us, and it's going to be ten times bigger in 2030. So it is a very much fast growing gap. So it seems to be almost impossible for Japan to indigenously maintain the status quo and the balance of power vis-a-vis -vis China, which uh, lead us to commit more to the United States uh, on the U.S.-Japan alliance at the time that the United States is somewhat reluctant to provide the full coverage of the Japanese uh, defense, especially under the President Trump. He said that the Japan should pay more and Japan should do more uh, in order to maintain uh, your presence uh, in Japan as well. But, but, but by looking at the other regional dynamics, it is not only that China is rising, but also India, Southeast Asia, um, and uh, Australia, all those actors are rising. So in order to offset the Chinese ever-rising kind of portfolio, uh, we really like to offset by expanding our diplomatic and security portfolio by engaging those regional powers. And that's why we are so much strategically interested in India, ASEAN, uh, Australia, and this, this time the intention is real. Uh, so uh, that's for the security and defense. And geoeconomic and outreach, uh, we also like to you know, upgrade uh, our commitments uh, and uh, look at CPTPP. You know, um, when President Trump says that we will do withdraw from TPP, if it was a traditional Japanese diplomacy, if the United States would not join, let's, let's you know, get rid of TPP. That's over. But our decision this time is that maybe T TPP as an original form is dead, but I think TPP standards still survives. So let's have a TPP standards as, as it is, and we will launch the TPP even without the United States. This is an amazing, I think, uh, Japanese diplomatic kind of decision. Uh, that we made, and uh, I, I simply was very surprised uh, that the Japan made that uh, decision uh, as well. So, and I really wonder what happens to our set <laughs> when uh, India is uh, now in the very difficult uh, position in dealing with that subjects. So let me uh, conclude by skipping some of the slides, which is not that important, and I think important is uh, uh, remaining two slides. What actually provide that, you know, um, for the future of the region? And uh, what, what you know, you know uh, Indo-Pacific uh, vision uh, will play uh, the role. I think that this vision, as uh, uh, Deputy Director uh, has kindly mentioned, that I, I think grasps the new reality of what's been happening. You know, you know distribution of power is uh, certainly changing, and uh, yet the global governance body and regional governance body is not really corresponding to those. Uh, the, those power distribution. So it's a very much a mismatch between how the power has been distributed and the, what kind of uh, power uh, should make a decision uh, to the regional order and the international order itself. And I think Indo-Pacific is one of the, I think, major adjustments uh, in, in this policy. And, and I think that this will, will provide a lot of like a constructive uh, framework for many countries to join in and to become uh, important stakeholders. That's number one. Secondly, yet there are so many versions of the Indo-Pacific, US, India, Australia, ASEAN, and EU, they have a kind of different ways to uh, uh, you know, perceive uh, the Indo-Pacific, geographical scope, uh, priorities, and what are the areas of, uh, of concern. But I, my, my personal take is that Indo-Pacific strategy will only be successful when we respect everybody's copyright. So don't say this is Japanese version, and don't say that we, we will follow the US version, but everybody has its own way of saying, and everybody claims the copyright, and we will embrace uh, those. Then. And then the, uh, you know, we, we at least share the terms of the Indo-Pacific, and we share the platform of the importance of the you know, um, uh, safety, security, prosperity uh, parts, and then that should be, I, I think, independently uh, pursued uh, by uh, those countries, and they are a growing kind of momentum uh, to uh, find the interface uh, among those uh, uh, concepts. That's one. And security and defense and geoeconomic outreach, I've already mentioned, that, that has also uh, gave uh, lots of impetus 
that uh, uh, Japan have uh, more access, uh, more interoperable operations and training exercise uh, with uh, regional powers like Australia, India, uh, and ASEAN. And I think that continue uh, to be, be so. And we also focus on the you know, common uh, concern, including our measures on the maritime domain uh, awareness, escalation control at sea, and also we also jointly help uh, those uh, coastal states to, uh, to create uh, maritime security um, uh, mechanism, I mean, uh, for, through the capacity building processes. And we, we need to have a more robust uh, coast guards uh, low enforcement processing, and that uh, we need to share the common operating pictures uh, in dealing with, uh, you know, uh, China's rise uh, in, in the maritime affairs. And the geoeconomics, uh, um, I think uh, CPTPP uh, uh, wish to have more members, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, even UK, uh, after the Brexit. Uh, I think they will come to us uh, to negotiate for TPP. It's, a, it's not even the Trans-Pacific anymore, but I think uh, this is the open concept uh, under the TPP standards. And uh, I, I like to know your opinion about the RCEP, but I think this also is not only about the economic order, but also uh, – Japanese has been saying that uh, RCEP without India is, is not a perfect form, and uh, we wish India to be the part. I, I know the Indian sensitivity. I know the Indian domestic issues, but I think that uh, as an institutionalized, what the kind of regional uh, economic order should look like, I think RCEP still uh, plays the important role uh, over it. And let me uh, conclude by mentioning the, some of the challenges. As I mentioned, that uh, there are we are not still in the consensus about what the Indo-Pacific strategy is all about. Uh, there are lots of differences you can find even between the United States and Japan, and obviously between India uh, and other, other countries uh, as well. How to converge and how, how to manage the differences uh, is, the I think, a very important uh, agenda uh, to be discussed uh, in coming uh, years as well. And secondly, uh, ASEAN, our you know, good neighbors, uh, have also decided to uh, adopt the outlook of the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, but by, by, by looking at uh, uh, their concept, uh, uh, there's no competitive elements uh, in the ASEAN's uh, outlook. So we should not misunderstand that the ASEAN is, all, you know, jointly on board uh, with uh, everyone, but uh, they are trying to say that the ASEAN should be uh, pretty much on the neutralized, uh, you know, uh, uh, function. And, uh, uh, you know, try to take a uh, comfortable distance uh, between United States, Japan, and other uh, – United States and China and other parts. So uh, it might be uh, not a good idea to just to try to shake hands because you are on the same boat uh, by accepting the Indo-Pacific. That's not what the ASEAN uh, wish to hear. But at least they have adopted the Indo-Pacific. So let's uh, have, you know, to try to find that some, somewhere you can find, a, you know, convergence in what they are trying to uh, pursue. And I think that this is a very important that the ASEAN did not, you know, adopt the outlook on the BRI, but that they adopted the uh, uh, outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So at least it's a very, very much a good news, but we have to understand the nuances. And finally, uh, very final, um, the important question here is that how to navigate the Indo-Pacific strategy under the current um, strategic competition between the United States uh, and, and China. Uh, I guess that on the security, uh, we have been conducting the strategic competition with China for decades. You know, since 1990s, we've, we've been doing this. It's not, not, a, not a new news at all. So that, that's fine, and I think there has been a growing uh, you know, understanding about China, about what we are doing, although there's uh, specific issues like a cyber, multi-domain battles, and easy to assure missile defense, and deterrence issues, nuclear weapons. There's lots of issues out there, but those are the traditional questions that I, we, we've been discussing uh, with China. But I think that the core parts we have to um, configure uh, is the, the economic domain which is not my specialty, but I think it is so uh, important. And I think including India, Southeast Asia, Japan, uh, all the countries are not prone to economic decoupling uh, with China because uh, China is heavily embedded uh, in our economy. They are part of the value uh, and uh, uh, production chain, although we have a certain concern about the Chinese economic model uh, and uh, their data policies. Uh, and their labor, you know, exports, uh, and also their investment styles uh, that would create the debt crisis uh, in Sri Lanka, Hambantota, 
and uh, you know, unfortunate kind of uh, plan delay in the high-speed railway in Indonesia. Uh, some kind of uh, security commitment to the Sihanoukville uh, in Cambodia. So we need, need to certainly have a check and balance uh, on this. But something that w it is certainly needed is that whether we can really provide the alternatives to Chinese engagement, economic engagement in the region. Without having the alternatives, they have uh, provided the very accessible economic investments, you know, nice devices and networks and services. And if we call it, don't, don't use Huawei. And then they will respond, what is the alternative? Where, where is something else? And there's nowhere. So we, we should have such kind of uh, scheme to compete uh, in a healthy way uh, that uh, there are lots of alternatives you can find. And then there's a lot of historical lessons you can learn. Uh, and then that the country may have a more like a strategic freedom uh, to choice, uh, choose between China and other countries. And there are so many other areas that the China can collaborate uh, with us as well. So I think this is the, where we are getting at, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jimbo. And uh, we have time for a few uh, brief questions.